The following program deals with a controversial subject. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. Viewers are invited to make a judgment based on all available information. This is your captain speaking. We are beginning our descent into madness. <laughs> And we are back to another edition of West of the Rockies. I'm Frank. Thank you guys for sitting around. I know it's late, but boy, do we have a, another exciting show lined up for everyone tonight. Genevieve, how are you doing over there? I'm doing very well. Thank doing you. Doing all right? Yes. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. We're really excited tonight because we have a, a really, really cool guest joining us tonight. We got a chance to check out this exhibit that's going on right now in Orange County, really close, I mean, literally across the street from Disneyland, more or less. And it's called Encounters, UFO Experience. And as many people know, UFOs, aliens, and all that stuff, it's a topic that we tackle quite a lot on this show. And we've talked quite to numerous people about it. So I was really excited to see that there is a little exhibit out there getting people interested on the topic. And our guest tonight, Brian Bouquet, is the guy that has put this thing together. Uh, so Genevieve, why don't you tell us a little bit about our guest tonight? Brian Bouquet is a uh, CEO and president of the event agency, a leading tour market and event company. They specialize in museum exhibitions, concerts, ice shows, theatrical shows, and sporting events. The company has been involved with some of the leading producers of live entertainment, which include Golden Voice, AEG Live, Harlem Globetrotters, Titanic, the Artifact of Exhibition, Star Trek, the Exhibition, The Producers, Disney on Ice, Monster X Games, Blue Man Group, USO Olympic Trials, Bodies, the exhibition and many more they've provided marketing services for events in 32 countries and 220 cities in the united states tonight we'll be focusing on mr bouquet's current exhibit namely encounters ufo experience which at this time is being housed in the anaheim garden walk mall it prides itself in being the world's first comprehensive exhibition exploring reports of ufos alien abductions and encounters with extraterrestrials this family-friendly exhibition features seven different galleries that focus on areas such as ancient alien encounters, the military's role in modern sightings, and pop culture's fascination with extraterrestrial life. Unique and extraordinary, much of the encounter's exhibition content was gathered from the private collections of ufologists from around the world. There are displays of original and replica artifacts, conceptual models, documents, film clips and recordings that support claims of ancient encounters through modern day sightings. And with that, I'd like to welcome Brian Bouquet onto West of the Rockies Radio. Brian, can you hear us okay? Yeah, thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. Thank, thank you, you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. As you can imagine, we are quite fascinated by this topic, and it's really cool to have an exhibit where people can go and get acquainted a little more with the issue of uh, UFOs and aliens, which is something that went from being kind of a hush-hush topic to now being probably as mainstream as you can get with cool things happening in the sci-fi world nowadays that kids and adults alike are interested in. How did the idea come about to do a UFO exhibit? I mean, it's not the most common topic, is it? <laughs> right, but it's just not one that's really been explored that much in the museum world. Um, there's been a couple that have toured so far. There was a Science of the Aliens exhibit that toured the uh, London Science Museum about five years ago. And then, of course, we have the Roswell um, Museum there. And mm -hmm. That's probably the biggest collection of um, artifacts related and storytelling related to uh, ufology. This exhibit really was built out of the need for putting the product to the general public, you know, putting more information to the general public. And we've done a variety of exhibitions that have toured through the same type of venue, like uh, shopping malls and kind of non-traditional venues. And we did it with an exhibit called Bodies, the exhibition, which is a human anatomy exhibit. And that exhibit could go pretty much anywhere, and uh, we could open the doors and we could invite the general public, and, you know, it was about the human body, and it had a, mm -hmm. a great sense of uh, interest to it, because everybody's got one, and 
so we said, okay, what's next? What's, what else do we have that's sensational that it's not out there enough or it's not out there in this type of medium? What is the medium that we can present in this uh, museum type exhibit? And UFOs was always a passion of mine. You know, I like the science of it and I'm almost like a, a disbeliever more than anything. I can't, I, I read so much into the stories that I try to find the fault in them. And uh, I was finding more and more that more and more UFO stories that I couldn't find the fault in them, that there wasn't anything wrong. So I said, okay, if I'm this deep into it, I'm going to send out uh, what we would normally do, uh, a survey the marketplace for it, which mm-hmm. is create some type of online survey and try and figure out whether people really would buy into uh, coming to see this experience or whether it really is just kind of entertainment and that's why it's become so pop culture lately. And the information is really great. We did a total of 40,000 national surveys, and we did them through a variety of channels. We did social media surveys, we did an online survey, and then we hired a survey group. And what came back was that 70% of people had some type of belief in aliens, whether they existed in a different galaxy, whether they visited, or what the status was. But 70% of the, of the population believed it. Something else is out there, you know. That there's another. Wow. Were you surprised by uh, the by that number of people that believe in that? Yeah, and I got that number, and I said, "Okay, well, what? How do we benchmark this? Was it against? Where, where were we ten years ago on this topic? Mm-hmm. Where were we twenty years ago on this mm-hmm. topic? What did American um, the, the American public believe in it? And the the rise in belief is substantial over even just the last 20 years, you know, went from 20% of Americans believed in UFOs to now what we're getting, which is 70%. And, and not just believed in UFOs, but believed in maybe alien life and that there's something else besides the life that we have on Earth. And I think if you try to substantiate that by NASA's claims that they're going to find, you know, alien life in the next 20 years and they're spending billions of dollars searching for it in the other galaxies and in our own galaxy. Certainly, uh, much smarter people than myself are of the same belief that uh, something else is out there. So, anyway, to make a long story short, we, we, we built the exhibit so that it would be for the general public. So you could walk in not really knowing anything about uh, the history of UFOs, the significance of UFOs, the uh, the amount of research and supported documents that go along the search for UFOs. There's a lot of people that just don't know how much time has been invested, time and money, by our government and by private parties into this. So the exhibit really gives you a first-timer's point of view of coming into uh, UFOlogy and study of I know you curated this whole exhibit. Before we get into that, just a minute ago, you were saying you're more of a, of a disbeliever trying to find the flaws in some of these stories. How did you personally get involved researching, if you will, the topic of aliens and UFOs? My first look at this was actually through that London Science Museum, the Science of Aliens exhibit, which I thought was interesting. And we ended up acquiring some of that five years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we bought the specimens from that because they were specimens. They basically, they wanted to show, their display was to show that uh, there's creatures on Earth now that could live in you know, a frozen environment mm-hmm. or a, uh, an environment that's that doesn't have oxygenated air or has extreme temperatures. Um, so, so we bought that exhibit because we thought it was so interesting, mm-hmm. and we, we wanted to bring it to the states and tour it around. And it actually went to the um, uh, San Diego and Space Museum for a little while, but it was a small exhibit. I said, okay, well, how can we build on this? How can we take something that's really science-based, factual, mm-hmm. and expand that? so that we've got a story to tell. And I started reading a lot of books, you know, a lot of on Donegan's, uh, uh, Eric on Donegan's uh, books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I probably read 20 or 30 books, you know, and then wow. I got buried in Internet search. And, and the Internet search was just like going down a rabbit hole. <laughs> you start researching one topic and then, you know, within an hour, you're reading about alien DNA starting the world, you know? Right, and, right. Uh, so it was, it was really tough to try and keep everything on a level where 
you're not intimidating people Mm -hmm. on the topic where you can, you can talk to anybody about it without, you know, sounding crazy, uh, more or less, you know, where, where you could say, Hey, this is an honest discussion. This is the science behind it. These are the facts behind it. And so that was the approach that I used in all of my research was, okay, well, what about this? Let's punch holes in this one. Let's punch holes in that one. If there are holes in it, let's, let's display it. Anyways, let's talk about it in the exhibit. And uh, we're not trying to sway anybody's opinion one way or another, but let's put all the information out there that there is. And if there's an expert witness testimony, how, how credible was the witness? Uh, did he have any other motivation for why he said or did mm-hmm. he or she, she said the things they did? So there was a lot of that, and I tried to try and tried to keep neutral on most of the topics, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's how the exhibit got designed. Uh, which big things were out there can I simplify, explain them in a very uh, easy format, and not try to be uh, too persuasive in, hey, you definitely have to, after you come through my exhibit, uh, you have to believe in your folks because that's really not what I wanted to, to do. I, I wanted people to come in and be interested in it mm-hmm. and say, okay, I buy this. I don't buy this. I'm going to go home. I'm going to look this stuff up. And mm-hmm. that's really what I wanted to do. That's probably the best way to go about it because obviously you have the both sides of the, of the fence on this argument. You have the people that try to convince that UFOs are real. And then you have the, the more skeptical side of the argument that basically says that they don't exist. And I think one of the most important things, at least it was uh, in, in my case, was coming across the information and me doing my own research and coming to my own conclusions. And I think that it's really great that that is the aim of this exhibit. Now, I know that you have set up this exhibit in such a way where it's almost a, a history, I guess, of the UFO alien phenomena in our world. Can you give us a brief verbal walkthrough how you decided to set up this exhibit and what stages of uh, UFO lore does it cover? Yeah, sure. And I'm sort of a creature of habit with the exhibit designs. We've done Titanic and Pompeii and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. A lot of these exhibits fall on a timeline, right? So the beginning with where it started and then where you are today or where it ended. And really the significant things that we're finding right now in ancient aliens really was our starting point. And and that's where we felt we could curate some really interesting topics to get people or the thought process going. So you walk into um, our first gallery is the Ancient Aliens Gallery, and that's really where it starts, you know, uh, with megalithic structures and the alignment of the structures to uh, flying planes from... Uh, 400 BC, I mean, uh, and then we have a variety of objects in there that we've, we've curated, and most of them are replicas, obviously, because you can't, can't travel with the real thing. Of course. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot of them are replicas. And once you get through the Ancient Aliens Gallery, you end up in the next kind of big wave, and there was a huge gap in time before UFOs became popular again. And it might have been because it corresponded with kind of the, the big media hitting it. It was the 1940s, right? Yeah. The 1940s all the way up to the uh, 1960s, really military was using the uh, UFOs for a lot of propaganda, a lot of cover-up, a lot of controversy, and some conspiracy. Right, mm-hmm. well. So really there's a big jump from ancient aliens into uh, military because that was the next big wave of UFO noise. So we went from the military gallery into kind of the 60s, which was most of our sightings. So uh, as media became more prevalent on the topic, Mm -hmm. the word spread faster, and obviously the 60s were the 60s, so maybe there were drugs, maybe it was (laughs) altered mind states, but... Whatever it was, there was a lot more sightings in the 60s than there were in the 50s. (laughs) So our timeline kind of takes you into the 60s and talks about some of the the bigger sightings that were occurring. And as you transition from the sightings gallery, which also includes, you know, some of the the cool uh, military stuff that was going on at the time uh, as well, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but you really transition from sightings into our abductions gallery, which was the next kind of wave of the UFO phenomena, mm -hmm. which was more and more people started saying, hey, I've been taken, I've had this experience, it's replicated very similar to the NDE, and uh, so we wanted to try and dive into that and try and replicate some of those things. We we put a uh, alien abduction experience in it just so that people could get a sense of what it was. It's not perfect by any means because mm -hmm. you don't get taken anywhere. You don't end up in a intergalactic travel. <laughs> uh, right. But for an earthly uh, recreation, we do try and recreate what most people say about their abductions, and that, you know they're really going through a white light type experience and they end up on a mothership with a bunch of other specimens. Mm -hmm. So we tried to replicate that within the exhibit. And those are the main galleries that are on display right now. Scattered throughout the galleries are a variety, over 70 different sightings and abduction stories that are detailed either with pictures or video or expert witness testimony or background stories. There's a lot to read and digest in the exhibition, but really those are the four most powerful kind of messages that we that we display in our exhibit. We have 911 calls that mm -hmm. have come in for years that we've recorded. Uh, we have some fun stuff in there to keep kids entertained, the laser shooting gallery, because we found that the kids would we blaze through the exhibit. Nobody wants to read, right? <laughs> right. Uh, we give them an audio tour, and they're still, you know, they hit the buttons when they're on next. So uh, mm -hmm. we put some other things in there that, that pop culture just kind of supports the storyline throughout, you know, guns from District 9 or from Men in Black or some of the other more popular uh, stuff that, that has been uh, emphasized by the media. It's gotten a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the summary of it. I, I'm, I'm so appreciative of you guys coming down and seeing it because it was great to walk through, and I know you guys spent uh, you know, a long time in the, in the gallery, so I know you're saying. It was really, really impressive. I mean, for me, it was great to see all of these things in one place. It's a very comprehensive uh, exhibit. And one of the things, actually, if I may, and I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to interrupt, but one of the things that I wanted to uh, ask you about, there's this small plaque, if you will, in, in the exhibition as you're making your way through called the Memorial Wall of UFO Researchers. And the subtitle is, Is Someone Killing Our UFO Researchers? And there's a, a, a very, I mean, honestly, it's a long list of, of individuals who have died mysteriously. Can you tell me a little bit about that particular uh, list of people? And you know what? What do you make of it? You know, there's some some big government officials in there. Secretary of Defense Forstel was in there. Uh, I think you probably read that brief. And uh, you know, there's been there's been several high level military officials that have disappeared, have been committed. I mean, that, we didn't even show that they've been committed to an asylum list. That's oh, a whole wow. different list. The memorial wall is hilarious, though, in that. You know, hilarious in the fact that there's so much uh, spillover. And when you lay all of these people out, uh, how they died, and they match up, you know, with how other people have died that have been mm -hmm. researching the topic, there's, a, there's a, a line that you can draw across. All of these people died this way shortly after they reported their sightings shortly after they reported their findings, shortly after they declared that there was definitely a UFO in the military's possession. I don't know why that's not being dug into more. Mm -hmm. For me, it's it's pretty uh, scary sometimes when, when you start looking at this, what I consider to be a bit of the dark side of, uh, of the uh, UFO alien phenomena, is that, that, yeah, you know, there have been people that have, under mysterious circumstances, either, you know, disappeared or, or passed away. And I really like the fact that you included that in the exhibit because, albeit it's uh, what I consider somewhat family-friendly, I I think it's accessible to kids and adults of all ages. I think that at the same time, it's putting stuff like this that kind of really makes you realize that this is a real phenomena that it's happening and that, you know, it's potentially putting people uh, that have researched it in danger. At least to me, it's a very important bit of information that should be uh, included. What are some of the uh, expert eyewitness testimony? I know you have uh, some video displays with people talking about their UFO encounters. Who are some of the people that are featured in these uh, videos? Robert Salas is uh, featured in there, and 
he was uh, commander in chief of the Malmstrom Air Force Base. Actually, he was uh, commander. He was he was working at the alternate Air Force Base in Montana at the same time mm-hmm. that the fighting happened. But uh, you know, he's he's an incredible, competent witness, high-ranking military official, crystal clear record. No, no no reason whatsoever for him to speak out on something strange and unusual. He. He had a great record in the military, and for him to come through and say, look, we, we had a UFO, we had an unidentified flying object which came over our base, basically shut us down. Um, I, I think he's spectacular. He's a, a wonderful witness in this. So I, 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 if there's any testimony within our witness testimonies, I think this is one of the more strong uh, witness testimonies that we have. Um, we have several others from... A variety of military bases that have spoken out, but he would probably mm. be the strongest. Around. Recently, as I mentioned at the top of the show, you know we have the X Files coming back with a few episodes, and obviously this has done a great deal in the raising awareness, if you will, to the subculture of alien UFOs, you know, conspiracy and all that type, you know, paranormal related topics. And uh, recently in the news, obviously the the CIA they almost poked fun a bit, saying you know that they were releasing you know some of their documents, which they call their own little X Files, and uh, and right. how to spot you. UFOs and Hillary Clinton uh, promising to investigate Area 51 and Obama talking about uh, UFOs and aliens. How do you view these things? Because to me, they're almost like, you know, the signs of the times, if you will. Whereas this was a topic that if you had any kind of public light upon you, if you mention aliens or, or UFOs, you would be shunned. However, now you have political figures and, and mainstream media discussing and talking about UFOs. How do you take that? Do you feel like we're moving Moving in a direction where uh, you know this might actually happen, we might actually be notified by NASA or the government that hey, you know, aliens and UFOs are out there. Or do you think they just don't know what's going on, and this is a sincere effort to figure it out? There's an opinion on a, on a bunch of sides there. So one could be one could be, and, and my opinion is that the media is softening up their uh, approach to this so that. At some point, you know, we are going to discover uh, alien life, and they're prepping us for that. Yeah. That uh, it's becoming an acceptable thing uh, if if uh, media is really that advanced, and if uh, so, if the powers that be are really that advanced and really taking us that seriously, mm-hmm. then they certainly should be um, warming the public to it so that it doesn't create chaos. The uh, other side of that, uh, the other side of that for me is that uh, it is becoming more acceptable, and people are talking openly about it. It's not you're not getting shunned anymore. If you believe in UFOs, you're not being mistaken for believing in uh, uh, the tooth fairy. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. um, so I I think that's really good. I think it's it's open. It's an open mind to it, which everybody should have uh, to think that uh, that we're alone is is pretty shocking you know? mm-hmm. it's almost like the abs- the absolute closed mind approach now. Let me make a quick parenthesis because I know you mentioned that you also work on the um, Pompeii exhibit and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, would that be the uh, the same uh, exhibit that was here in LA? Yeah, so we were at the California Science Center. The company I worked for mm-hmm. represented Pompeii uh, the Pompeii exhibit from uh, Italy for five years, I guess, on the on the tour, New York, California Science Center, Philadelphia, and I'm trying to think what other markets. One of the market, anyway, is very similar in terms of its content display. Ours, obviously, mm-hmm. uh, for UFOs, we've made it a lot more uh, kind of entertainment than Pompeii was. Uh, Pompeii was a disaster, and, and I didn't want to portraying the UFOs mm-hmm. as a, a, something that could be devastating. Mm, yeah. Right. Yeah, because I was going to ask what were some of the uh, unique challenges of putting something like this UFO exhibit together? The storyline has to be to make it a really good exhibit and to make it kind of a, a, a different learning experience. You have to have 3D objects so that people can relate to the story. They're not just reading words on a page. Otherwise, they could sit at home and do it on their computer. And we really had a hard time getting 
the artifacts for the exhibit. We tried for about a year to get Betty Hill's dress mm. uh, wow. mm-hmm. and put that on display. And we worked with the New Hampshire a Museum that had it, and then we worked with Betty Hill's just nobody wanted to put it on display. And for the uh, people that might not be familiar as to, you know, this this dress, they might know the story of Betty and Barney Hill, but what's the significance of Betty Hill's dress? Uh, just the protein fabrics in the dress. Obviously, she was abducted, and uh, one of the, the things that came back from the abduction was a protein fiber on the dress that, Uh, was was different and significant uh, in that case particularly. This was a pretty hard and fast um, piece of evidence in one of the biggest abduction cases of our, our time, you know, it, uh, outside of maybe Fire in the Sky with uh, Travis Walton. I think the Betty Hill story was probably uh, one of the more significant ones. She was telling tales of a galaxy that we didn't discover <laughs> mm-hmm. with the telescopes until 10 or 15 years later. She had some insight to space travel, whether she was just brilliant astrologist or, or whether she had an experience is a different story. But Betty Hill dress is just one of many artifacts that we tried to acquire. That we, mm-hmm. just, we had a heck of a time getting the originals. You know, Nobody mm-hmm. wanted right. to let go of what they had. The alien implants could not get those alien implants wow. to save our life. We were going to replicate those as well, but then you look at them and they can't be replicated. They're so unique. I mean, I had two model makers look at them and say, look, this just can't, we can't do this. It won't make a strong enough display. It's wow. Yeah. Like looking at a grain of rice, you know? Wow. Um, And, and, and the technology within that grain of rice, it would be hard to detail. So what do you do? Do you, blow, do you blow it up so then it's like a big thing and then nobody believes it could actually be in your skin? So they, they, that was the problem, was finding the 3D objects to support the storyline. Mm-hmm. And um, we did end up with, I think, about 100 different objects in the exhibit. But, wow. Uh, Pompeii, by contrast, I think he's about 20 different objects, so. Wow. And what's the process like, you know, recreating some of these objects? I mean, how long does that take and how much research goes into that? Well, the, we have to get all of the specs from everything and then create from scratch. And we had three model makers, which we just went down to one mm-hmm. uh, after the first couple because it was it was tough stuff to replicate, you know, mm-hmm. from pictures and the designs unless you actually fly and go see the objects themselves, um, very tough to replicate. And thankfully, we had some uh, relationships with MUFON and a couple other organizations that had access to these items or had contributors to these items uh, so that we could either get our hands on them or we could get detailed specifications on them. I mean, that's an incredible feat, you know, <laughs> recreating all these various things that, as they are, pretty complicated and different. It was frustrating because it was frustrating because you try to build your cases for them, right? So you're yeah. trying to lay out the whole exhibit and you're trying to build it. And then all of a sudden you get your hands on an artifact um, that's bigger than anything else in the room and so you've got to design a special case <laughs> for it and then it sends everything else out of whack. Yeah. So now you've got this great artifact you want to display that you don't have any room for. Mm. So, and and conversely, conversely, you build cases in one gallery like our Space Propulsion Gallery and there's not enough stuff to put in there. Mm-hmm. You know, we so that was the challenge in trying to design uh, uh, an exhibit that was being conceived from zero yeah. and didn't have a, a coll- didn't have a collection already established like Pompeii or Titanic mm-hmm. or King Todd or any of those things we were creating a collection oh yeah and especially if it's a traveling exhibition you have to deal with the fact that every single location is just so different yep mm-hmm. speaking of traveling i know the exhibit started in south carolina correct and the uh, stop before uh, anaheim was arizona what has the reception been like so we we opened in myrtle beach and it was partially because it became myrtle beach was becoming a, a hot spot for ufos oh wow Um, so, so we ended up going to Myrtle Beach to test this as kind of a, 
I don't want to say like a Ripley's Believe It or Not mm-hmm. type of presentation, but into that same audience, which is not a big museum goer audience, right? It's mm-hmm. not people that, it's a very blue collar destination. Nothing against Myrtle Beach, it's a gorgeous place, but very blue collar destination. And uh, it was funny because some of the complaints when we first opened was, uh, you know, you, we went in there and we actually had to read something. <laughs> wow. um, <laughs> so we ended up doing the audio guide so that more people could come in and enjoy mm-hmm. it without having to see, uh, all, you know, a lot of things. Right. Uh, but Myrtle, Myrtle Beach was very well received. It's a, a small town, but in the summer, the, the audience swells to mm-hmm. seven or eight million people. And it's That's a very great. tight uh, area, geographic area. So, we did very well there, and then uh, we went to Arizona, and in uh, you know basically five weeks, we did the same business in Arizona that we did over three months. Oh in, wow! Uh, Myrtle Beach, yeah. So um, it was very well received in Arizona. Mm-hmm. I don't, I think, I, you know, they've had some tremendous sightings in Arizona. Yeah. I think there's a lot of media coverage there. I just, uh, you know, I, I work at the exhibit, as you guys know, often just so I can hear some of the stories. Mm-hmm. And, uh, my, my time at the front desk in Arizona was uh, captured every day for hours of storytelling of people. It seems, mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, mainly on the reservations, you know, because once you get out of the big city lights and everything, mm-hmm. you've got a clear sky. Yeah. Um, things become a lot more apparent, so... Uh, a lot of a lot of sighting stories were told to me. <laughs> Maybe some to add to the <laughs> exhibition. Well, I was going to say, on your website, ufoexhibition.com, for people that want to check it out, you have a section just for stories where you allow people to share some of their uh, UFO sightings. If you could yeah. just, uh, top of your head, can you just tell us like one of the uh, stories that you've heard from somebody that has visited the exhibit that has really struck you as one of those that, that are hard to dismiss as just fantasy or imagination? I don't get to know the people more than, for more than a few minutes, right? Mm-hmm. So I take everybody at face value and, and um, the stories, you know, you, you, they, they can sound either well rehearsed uh, there's been a family story that has come down for years, mm-hmm. um, and I, I probably have a few of those in my family, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that, are, that are not not UFO related, but maybe a haunting or something yeah. like that. So mm-hmm. you have to get through a lot of those, and you know, I, I heard one probably in Arizona that was the most daunting, which was she was a probably a sixty year old woman. She was there with her family. They were uh, very nice. Uh, family and she pulled me aside afterwards because everybody does that. They pull you aside. They don't want, you know, they don't necessarily want you. To, everybody to know that they're telling this inside story or whatever. And she sat me down and said that she had uh, been traveling from northern Arizona to, uh, I think, to New Mexico, and uh, she had been driving for about an hour and a half, and she was in one of the reservations. It was not about a reservation. And forgive me if my facts are wrong. She said that she's driving. She had a, another person in her car, and as she's coming up the roadway, uh, she saw three beings on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. And this was like 11 o'clock at night. And she's like, oh, this is just, mm-hmm. it must be local natives or something that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that are doing their work. And uh, as she got closer to him, and me, it's funny, I'm telling this story right now, and my skin is crawling. So <laughs> I can wow. tell you that this is the same emotion I had when she was telling me this. Yeah. Uh, as she got closer, she realized these weren't three people with, like, baskets on the top of their head walking across the street. They weren't, you know, wearing sheets or whatever. These people, mm-hmm. three beings, had a glow to them. Oh, wow. And so she pulled she pulled within about 100 yards of them with her headlights on, and the three beings traveled and sort of put, uh, flowed across the street and down into the ravine and never, you know, never to be seen again. She pulled up closer in her car. There's nothing there. Um, gone. Never to be seen again. Wow. And, um, and, and it all comes from uh, you're standing there talking to a person who you have to give the benefit of the doubt to and mm-hmm. really try to read something into that person whether they could be telling you a 
bunch of nonsense. Or the, the, like I said, it's a family story that's been passed down. It's such a great story. I, I think that's probably the, one of the better ones out there. Uh, one of the cases that you have um, at this exhibit is an event that happened in 1974, August 25th, to be exact, 1974 in Chihuahua, Mexico. Can you tell us a little bit about yeah. that case? Because that's almost like the Mexican Roswell, if you will, but it gets really, really crazy. Coyote, Mexico, and that's my, by far my favorite uh, story. And I think I pointed that out to you guys. It's a little, very long lead in the exhibition, and I think if you... Uh, wanted to, you, you could spend days researching what happened, mm -hmm. what did happen, didn't mm -hmm. happen, what was, what was myth, what was reality. Uh, but, you know, the reality is 18 Mexican soldiers or police force lost their lives, uh, investigating a crash site. Uh, high toxins of radiation are tested in the ground soil. These are facts. Off the charts. The U.S. government flew sorties, uh, over international airspace in search of something uh, related to uh, a flying object. Uh, you don't often cross into international borders without due cause. And um, they just did it with really, um, without any um, notification. I think uh, once the uh, U.S. troops got there with their hazmat suits, the scene was so, uh, was so bad in terms of the number of deaths that were there that they were just shocked. Uh, it's a very good read, and if you want to talk about uh, a couple of different government agencies being involved, and uh, you had some some death as a result, uh, it's one that should be taken very seriously. Yeah, no, that particular case, uh, I I've heard about this case over the years, and actually, the first time I heard about it was uh, from my my father. It's so out there, but at the same time, you can't dismiss it as just a complete fabrication. You also are faced with cases that have been seen by, by hundreds, maybe thousands of people, like the Phoenix Lights, which uh, I believe you guys also have a, a model on display there, right. along with some of the other sightings. Can you tell us what are some of the other sightings that are showcased in the exhibit? Sure. Um, and, and we cover the 1997 Phoenix Lights. I think the others, um, it was 2000 and 2002. So, you know, they were kind of dismissed. The Air Force was was running flights those nights. And, um, you know, we did, and there was a conspirator in one of them who was uh, definitely creating a hoax. But the 1997 event for Phoenix was another, you know, a showstopper, right? Mm -hmm. 2,000 people saw it. Uh, it's, it when they initially uh, contacted the Air Force base, nobody knew crap about anything. And all of a sudden... Yeah, oh yeah, we were dropping flares. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we we were doing military testing at night. Forgot about it. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, they, 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 that's not what 10,000 people saw. And, right. Um, so that's highlighted in there. The fire in the sky, which I talked about, Travis Walton's incident, I think is another really pertinent, uh, not only abduction, but sighting. If you go back to the location where that all occurred today, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the trees are all, and, and I don't know if we talked about this or. Yeah, no, we yeah, yeah. we were discussing some of the uh, yeah, recent. The, yeah, yeah, the tree yeah. rings. Yeah. Crazy, right? Yeah, uh, no, it's incredible. Growing away from the radiation, growing away from the site. So mm -hmm. I think that's really cool as a follow up to Travis Walton's story. And I've met Travis. Uh, he's an interesting guy and mm -hmm. something. Very strange happened to him. You know? yeah, absolutely. Um, we cover the Malmstrom Air Force Base, one which I think is another really... Uh, too many government officials were involved in that one to make it a hoax. And then we also cover the uh, Rendlesham Forest, which was, again, military base. You know, the Black Forest. Right. Mm -hmm. It was just... Uh, you've got that many people that say they've touched a UFO. I think there were two officers that said they touched a UFO. They did soil samples. There was science behind what occurred there that documented uh, really what, every, what the witnesses were stating. So I don't know how you argue those, but those are probably my favorite five, too. So. Well, while we're at it, why don't we do the, your top five UFO slash alien cases that really have gripped your attention? So I'll start in 67 with Malmstrom and talk about that briefly just because 
it was a complete shutdown of a nuclear uh, air force base. You know, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. nuclear mi- missile silos and everything else. You could argue that the Chinese or, or the Russians all of a sudden came up with uh, an amazing system to shut us down, and this was just an incredible feat of uh, engineering at, at the time. They would have been so far advanced in our military capabilities that we, we'd be bowing to them now. Um, it, it's just impossible to think that they, they had that kind of technology that they could shut us down in the middle of Montana. Mm-hmm. Um, so something something flew over and, and zapped our power source and, and showed us uh, we were weak, you know. And so I, I, I really love that one because it, it was, again, eyewitness testimony, uh, a science, something actually did shut down. It wasn't a power surge. It wasn't, it, none of that occurred. Mm-hmm. It was just, just a, a crazy, unexplainable um, Fighting an incident. Right. 1974, which we talked about, was uh, famous. And that one's, again, it's got all the facts uh, to back it up. And something very strange happened that we've just kind of swept under the rug. It hasn't been brought up. Uh, you know, it, it should be in modern day media all over the place. And somebody should be getting to the bottom of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 1975 with Travis Walton, I think. Uh, you know, we've dug into it, and he's, everybody's tried to dismiss Mr. Walton as much as possible, and everybody yeah. he was with. And I, I, you know, they can't. They, these guys have passed lie detector tests, and they, right. uh, their stories held true. And yeah. uh, there's there's scientific evidence that something strange happened in the force. So. Mm-hmm. In 1987, probably the uh, uh, the Phoenix Lights, which was one of our uh, bigger bigger ones um, in terms of our our sightings. Uh, it's, it's undisputable about how many people saw it. Um, well, for me, I'm a pretty big music fan, so I'd have to say that the other one would be, I think it was 2004, the Ozfest. Mm-hmm. And that was a whole concert that had a... Uh, that had a sighting and uh, some lightning that occurred mm-hmm. within okay. the sighting, during the sighting. So the offset sighting was, was cool because uh, it wasn't just like uh, a big hallucination. It right. was witnessed by a lot of people at one time. It's almost like a stadium full of people. So oh, that's really the interesting. Same exact thing at the same yeah. time. So I haven't heard of that time. case. Yeah, I um, think um, I think I remember hearing a bit about it, but to be honest, to be a hundred percent honest, I had completely forgotten about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally you, forgot about that. Made national news, um, and it was just a bunch of people that saw it at one time. So what do you say? You, yeah. you doubt, you know, seven thousand people that say I saw. I this, I saw a triangular UFO fly over there. Yeah. And shortly after that, there was lightning streaks. How, how do you dispute that? So, yeah. yeah. Those are my top five. And we'll be putting those top five onto our website as well for anyone else to review. Yeah. And uh, Brian, cool. be- before we let you go, why don't you tell people where they can catch the exhibit and how long is it going to be running and where is the next stop? Well, uh, first, I'm very thankful to you guys for putting me on the radio. That was very nice of you. I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic whenever the exhibit can get some coverage. And no, thank uh, you. We're able to <laughs> tell more people about it, so I appreciate it. It's our pleasure. The uh, exhibit's running until May 31st right now at the Anaheim Garden Walk right across from Disney. Uh, we have a very good deal on tickets through our partner Groupon. Uh, the tickets basically average 7 bucks a person for $14. Mm-hmm. You can get two tickets online. It's the cheapest way to come in. Our, our tickets at the door are $12 and $8 for children. The mm-hmm. Like I said, with the ch- when you bring in the children into it, it, they sort of blast through it pretty quick. So um, we children under eight are free. Children eight to sixteen are eight dollars. Mm-hmm. And um, we've seen some kids come in who are really interested in science and space exploration, and they're in there with their dads, and they just have a blast. Uh, but then we've seen the kids who are moderately interested and not interested. The parents come in and they don't get time to enjoy it. So mm-hmm. I just wanted to give that as a caveat. Uh, 
when you're planning or if you're planning on coming to see our exhibit. But really, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of storytelling. Uh, it's almost like getting into a really good book, and you got to kind of tune in. So. That's very cool. And the website for more information is ufoexhibition.com and facebook.com. Is uh, facebook.com forward slash encounters UFO, correct? Correct. Brian, what can I say? It's been a pleasure talking to you about this exhibit. We encourage everyone to check it out and visit the website and, of course, uh, the actual exhibit as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there any plans to take the exhibit to another town after uh, Anaheim? Yeah, we've got a couple other cities that are interested in having us. Uh, Savannah, Georgia has contacted us, and we're interested in trying to get down to Texas because it's kind of a hotbed. Right. Interesting location for us, and so we're trying to go where uh, there's a lot of sightings and where there's a lot of uh, interest in the topic. Mm -hmm. Very cool, very cool, Brian. Thank you so much for for being with us tonight. Uh, we wish you the best of luck, and like I said, the exhibit thank is a blast, and we really encourage people to check it out. Thank you so much. I'm very blessed to be on. Have thank a great you. Night. You too. Have a great night. That was uh, Brian Bouquet of the uh, Encounters UFO Exhibit. Mm -hmm. It's really great. I'm telling you, we went, we had a blast. We're going to be posting a couple of the pictures that we took. It's fun. I, I even got a picture with one of the Vogons from <laughs> Hitchhiker's um, Guide to the Galaxy that had some of the original artifacts. They even had one of the um, uh, original props, prototypes from the Aliens movie, which I thought was amazing. Honestly, they had a lot of really cool, interesting stuff. And it's really great to have this type of thing going across the country and to get people interested. And I also like the fact that, you know, he's not trying to sway you in any type of direction, exactly. just putting out the facts it's, yeah. and it's up to you and to make the decision. It's entertainment and take from it what you will. Like I said, definitely check it out if you're going to be in the area in the next few weeks before uh, it takes off to another galaxy. Maybe not so far away, hopefully, and <laughs> another place where people can catch it. We want to thank Mr. Brian Bouquet one more time for being the guest tonight and uh, talking to us about this UFO exhibition mm -hmm. that I definitely encourage everybody to check out. You can go to the website, ufoexhibition.com, and visit the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash encounters UFO. And, and you're going to you know, see that is really, really fascinating stuff. Stuff. The fact that they got the website address ufoexhibition.com shows you how how new this idea of having a UFO exhibit That's true. is. Usually I mean, yeah, URLs just, get snatched up quite quickly, if yeah, I may so say so myself. Yeah, so this is really, you know, the first of its kind. Yeah, so definitely check it out. Uh, like I said, we went, we had a blast, and it was a lot of fun. Of course, meeting uh, Mr. Bouquet in person, I mean, definitely uh, uh, say no, hello to him. He's such a lovely guy. He's yeah, really and cool. uh, if you got a story, definitely share it with him, because uh, he sounds like he's quite interested in hearing all of that. Uh, hey, you might, you might be featured. You might be featuring the next installment of this exhibit yeah <laughs> that being said take care be safe god bless don't do anything too crazy we want to see you back next week enjoy this tune we'll see you next week see you Bye -bye. good night west of the rockies with frank the engineer on the independent fm los angeles